I would like to begin by saying it's been entirely too long for us not to have published anything to the channel. And for that, we have this history of topic today. The history of Sony's PSX DVR system. Throughout this video I will discuss what it is, the reception of the device on release, my own personal history, and issues plaguing the PSX DVR. I'm Artug from MPC Gaming Group, and this is the history of the PSX DVR. The PSX is quite simply and plainly stated a DVR, but as it was sold on release, it was everything. If you were a lucky middle class person in Japan during the Christmas 2003 season and could afford it, this seemingly simple white box might have appeared in your living room on Christmas Day. This is no ordinary white box, however. It's a cable slash aerial tuner, photo editor, PS2, PS1, DVD player, DVD author, music ripper, and more. The PSX DVR was an innovation for its time, as in order to give a timetable for the viewer not quite born around these times, the Power Mac G5 had just released, MySpace had just been founded, and EVE Online had just launched. It was quite some time ago in the grand scheme of technology. Everything was a little heavier and tech was just a little bit slower. The PSX DVR has a very familiar interface. And as you can see, it is eerily familiar to modern day Sony products. The Sony XMB, or the media crossbar, which can be seen in all or most of Sony's modern entertainment products, made its debut on the PSX DVR in 2003. The similarities notwithstanding, there are some things you can do with this DVR that you can't in modern consoles, namely the MP3 ripping option, photo editing, and DVD authoring. The disc reader in the PSX supported both DVD-R and DVD-RW standard formats for reading and writing to both single-write and multi-write DVDs. And with the PSX DVR you could also export photos and videos onto a Memstick Pro card meaning you could take pictures and video recorded on the DVR and move them over to the PSP for mobile viewing. It may not seem like a big deal now, as interconnected media on portable devices is very common, but back then it would have been awesome to record a show on the DVR and move it over to your PSP for viewing on the go. There is a consensus among those in the West that this was a gaming console, and this is because of how the device has been viewed in the West. Namely that it was a PS2 first and foremost, and the DVR feature made it a PlayStation that could record things. The reality, however, is the exact opposite. As most of those who lined up for this DVR desired to do so, because it would make their lives a little bit more convenient. As in the case for a gentleman who lined up on a blistering cold day in December of 2003, outside of an electronics store in Yorokucho, a business district in Tokyo merely blocks away from the Imperial Palace. I already have a PS2 he stated plainly, but I wanted a PSX instead of my VCR. And this is kind of an overlooked feature, as to most of the collectors and hobbyists from the West, they kind of wanted to have a niche little PS2. And some 20 odd years later with the convenience of streaming platforms and modern methodologies of consuming media, the novelty of a DVR doesn't quite have the same impact it did 20 years ago. This was a time when there were no streaming services such as there are now, and when 250 gigabyte hard drives were considered very large. So in my humble opinion, the PSX DVR wasn't a bad unit as most of the West has viewed it, but simply a product of a time forgotten. So given the nature of what it was, how was it received among the intended customer base? The answer to that question is a bit complicated. According to an article I found on PC Watch, folks who lined up to get the PSX largely were not looking for another PS2 but rather they were purchasing the unit to better ease the burden of recording video off of a VCR. There was a largely unspoken but rather popular hobby back in the 90s and early 2000s to record video off broadcast television to create complete collections of anime, television, Korean soap operas, and private cassette form. Those hobbyists, at least from what I can glean from the article, are the intended customer base, like the gentleman mentioned earlier lined up outside of Vera Cucho. Early sales and pre-orders appeared to be promising. Sony's initial release stock had largely sold out during the Christmas season of 2003, and it appeared on paper that the PSX was a hit. Tomoaki Tsukamoto was a manager of a similar electronics and camera boutique in Shinjuku called Yodobashi Camera. There are quite a few reservations for the PSX, Tomoaki said. We have secured some stock, but we may run out of inventory before the weekend's up. 
Mr. Tsukamoto's store had roughly 40 people lined up at around 8.30 in the morning at the time of release. And according to the article from PC Watch, there were primarily a majority of male customers lined up for the purchase of the PSX DVR. Which was an odd thing to note until I found out how it was unveiled to the world. Or at least how it was marketed at first. Create Tech Japan was an electronics and engineering show that demonstrated new technology in customer electronics and mobile phones. And in October 2003, Sony had a demonstration booth to show off the latest and greatest in their creations. Notable new creations at the time are a new Sony Ericsson phone, a Sony VAIO desktop offering, and a small overlooked white box which, as you may have guessed, was the PSX DVR. Normally in a video such as this I would have taken the time to show you a picture of then Sony CEO Nobuyuki Ade sitting in front of the booth with the PSX down in the lower left, however Getty Images wants $500 for the rights to use the image. So instead I'll place a link to the copy of the image down in the description below along with all links to the articles I've perused during my research. So, for the launch, initial sales were plentiful and businesses were looking forward to future sales of the PSX DVR going off without a hitch. After the holiday season passed and the PSX DVR continued to be sold in electronic stores, sales largely stagnated, which brings us to the October Createch 2003. The PSX DVR was announced at that show a mere two months before it was due on shelves. Problem number one established. Well, what about the primarily male customer base? Well, not to delve too deeply into gender roles, but traditionally speaking, nerds and electronics enthusiasts have been largely male. So not only did Sony market this to a niche crowd, but they also alienated about half the potential customer base by not universally marketing. Aha, things are starting to make sense. The marketing to a niche audience and the relatively quick turnaround from introduction to sales in December meant that Sony made a major misstep in coming to market too early. But not only did it come to market too quickly, largely no one knew about the device except for a group of electronics enthusiasts and some otakus looking to supplant the 200 to 300 VHS tape library with a digital one. It only makes sense now that Sony's big gamble turned into a commercial failure over the course of the two years that it was made. To say nothing of its relatively hefty price tag in comparison to the VCR and cassette solution. So while the unit was technically capable, thanks to the marketing and relatively quick release, it was met with a very tepid response. Sony officially discontinued productions and sales of the unit around February of 2005. But how and why did I come to know about the PSX DVR? Before I explore what modern history tells us about the DVR, I would like to first take a moment to go over my own personal history of how I came across it. Rewind the clock with me to the year 2004. Confessions Part 2 is on the radio, the Mars Spirit Rover was landed and on Mars proper, and Martha Stewart had just been convicted and sentenced. It's a good thing. I was in my intensive Japanese study, living inside the city of Yamanashi, as part of a year-long exchange program with my university. During the course of this year, I studied intensive Japanese language and in general took in the culture and nuance of both Yamanashi and Japan. It wasn't a lavish lifestyle, mind you, as I lived on $90 a week from private school where I taught English. Of course, lifelong fascinations with hardware don't really disappear overnight. So while I was in Japan, land of the rising sun and producer of all things really cool, naturally I was going to look for some things that caught my interest. So sometime in mid-April, an electronic store called Yamada Denki, there was lit a beautiful display of shiny white boxes with the PSX logo emblazoned on them. At the time, I didn't know much in the way of Japanese, and as I'd only arrived toward the end of March, the only thing that I knew was how to say hello and where's the bathroom. So the only thing this display had was the raw energy of the mystery Sony branded boxes which to an enthusiast like me had all the areas of my simple monkey brain, which was just screaming one word repeatedly, want. I didn't know what they were at the time, I just knew want. Sitting on the display were a pair of the PSX units clocking in at $1,026.90 for the DESR 7000 and roughly $837.90 for the DESR 5000 model. Naturally, at the time, I couldn't read very much, but thanks to the picture I took at the time and the videos, 
I can say that each of the models promised to give me a brand new, unstoppable entertainment power. And looking at the screen in the picture, the promo video is bragging that the PSX DVR also has the Emotion Engine graphic synthesizer inside of it. And yet, for all the noise and all the desire, the same voice echoed loudly in my head. Want. But thanks to my meager income, all I could do was sob, as my $360 a month would have to be spent on stupid things like food, phone, and lodging, as opposed to appeasing my monkey brain. But as Wayne said in Wayne's World, oh yes, it will be mine. Fast forward to modern times and shorten and sweeten, oh yes, they were both made mine. As luckily I found a DESR 5X unit and 7X unit on eBay in working condition, making my personal fascination with the devices go full circle. A tempting obelisk and clean looking display in the year 2004 to on my shelf from a junk auction in 2017. Even with my successful acquisition of the unit some 15 odd years later, I still dare not boot it up to use. Even though I'd acquired the object of my monkey brain, there still remained the issue of age, wear, and problems that through only time were revealed. The PS DVR was a fantastic device, but in reality, even upon release, it was beset with its own problems. The PSX, first and foremost, is quite hefty, weighing in at 12 pounds, 1.8 ounces. Even versus its entertainment brother, the PS2, at four pounds, 13.6 ounces, it is quite heavy by comparison. Given the weight, it was harder to move from one place to another to play with friends, so even if you were magically in Japan during the release window of the DVR, or even to the end of its life, most likely you were placing this in the living room and not moving it. Due to Sony's quick turnaround in order to meet the December 2003 holiday season, features like MP3 support, CDRs, and DVD-RWs had to be cut from the console. They were eventually patched back in thanks to the broadband support system, but at release, folks were a bit disappointed that they were missing. Fast forward to modern times for collectors that are trying to get a hold of this device. If you were to browse Yahoo or eBay auctions today, there would be plenty of devices listed for relatively cheap for a PSX DVR. The pictured DESR 5100, which was a rare silver variant of the PSX console, which appeared around July 1st, 2004. It featured all the stacks of the 5X generation, sporting a 160GB hard drive, and has the notoriety of being the only color variant actually to be released. So it's relatively rare to find one in working condition. So why then is this auction so cheap? These PSX DVRs are listed for relatively cheap because they are listed in junk or four parts condition as they do not work. But not for the reasons one might think. Collectors trying to get a hold of these cheap units would come to find that the reason why there are so many plentiful options for the consoles is twofold. Failing discs and failing hard drives. For the DVD drive, it's not much of a problem for a good tech to replace a spindle motor, DVD laser, or CD laser. So the spinning discs were never really too much of a hurdle. Inconvenient, yes, but impossible to fix, no. The issue with the disk drive is that the firmware on the DVD control board was permanently tied to the hardware it was sold with. So if anything went wrong with the control board for the DVD assembly, one couldn't just swap in a replacement working drive from another unit. So the repairs would have to be done on the faulty DVD drive itself. And believe it or not, this was actually the most promising scenario. If you had a working PSX but a non-working DVD assembly, it was totally within the realm of possibility to find replacement lasers, spindle motors, contact switches, and the like. The main problem with the PSX, at least from the modern history perspective, was the spinning disk hard drive. And to get to the main issue with this, one has to step back and appreciate the source of this issue. And for the sake of video length, if you grow bored with this section of the video or don't enjoy technical explanation, feel free to skip to the timecode listed below. So, I assume if you're still around, you're interested in hearing about the details of how data is stored on a hard drive. Still, for the sake of the video I won't go into depth, but rather a high level overview. A spinning disk hard drive, either from back then or from now, operates under the same basic principles. Picture a record. Looking really closely, one can make out small grooves in which the record needle sits. So when the record starts to spin, the needle will start following along each of these grooves to mimic the process that went to creating those grooves. 
And when the record finally gets up to speed, the needle will reproduce the original audio recording, amplifying the signal so we can hear it. Hard drives work in a similar manner. Instead of visible grooves, we have invisible portions on the discs called tracks. The image on the screen is a picture of the inside of a common hard drive. The shiny surface in the middle of the screen is called the platter, or the disc. The grooves from the record are all stored there, but they're simply too small for the human eye to perceive. And by grooves, of course, I meant small magnetized areas of varying polarity that will represent a 1 or a 0, the basics of binary data. The collective 1s and zeros read off the disc will indicate what was stored there. See the tiny little device on the end of the metallic swing arm? That is known as the magnetic reed head. And when the disc spins up, this magnetic reed head moves over each of the tracks and reports back the changes in magnetic field as a series of ones or zeros. Eventually the platter spins up so quickly that it will form a barrier of air over the surface of the disc, and that prevents the magnetic reed head from actually making contact with the surface. After spinning up, the magnetic reed head will report back along the red track, recalling and writing data to and from a hard disk. And for the sake of this video, the record and the disk are both similar in function, although one is analog and one is digital. And now for the fun part. Each hard drive has a controller. The controller sits underneath the hard drive and takes those raw ones and zeros and acts as an intermediary between the device and the hard drive. Basically, the controller tells the device it's connected to how much capacity the drive is capable of and how to handle reading and writing requests that come to and from the hard drive. As you can see from the picture, this is given on the back of most hard drives at the time in the form of cylinders, heads, and sectors. This will give a visual estimate of how many bytes can be stored on a hard drive at any one time. This hard drive, for example, has 19,640 cylinders, 16 read heads, and 63 overall sectors. Suffice it to say, a hard drive's calculated capacity is covered extensively in both scientific paper and generalized on sites like Wikipedia. But the scope of this technical section was merely to give an idea of how capacity is reported and the nature of how data is stored on a hard disk. Now using this information, imagine that on the hard drive label, say from a PSX DVR, it reports it has a capacity of 250 gigabytes. Yet, when we take the same hard drive and plug it into another machine, for example a PC, the hard drive reports it has a capacity of 249.5 gigabytes. Differences in formatting aside, in this case it is because the controller is reporting a different value for what is on the hard drive versus what's on the label. But why would a hard drive controller lie to us? So, since folks are well educated now on the nature of the hard drive, or skip the technical explanation, we can get on to the meat and potatoes of the issue at hand. Basically, Sony is hiding stuff. On the track that other devices can't get to, there's a section of the disc set aside for Sony's PSX bootloader information. A bootloader is basic low-level operating system set of instructions and points to either a section of the disc to boot into a proper operating system or can load information for input and output control. In this case, the PSX DVR requires information off of this unreadable portion to load the XMB and associated connected devices such as the DVD drive, the network controller, and other devices that might exist inside the PSX DVR. And to top it off, not only is this section walled off from everyone else, but the bootloader information is encrypted and tied to the unit. Couple that with the average lifespan of a hard drive being around five years or so, given regular use, and we have a recipe for disaster. If the PSX hard drive dies, the whole system is nothing but a beautiful 12 pound, 1.2 ounce paperweight. And to this day, there hasn't been enough interest in cracking Sony's encryption to allow the substitution of other drives in the PSX DVR. Thankfully, more modern systems have not stored data in this way, as they have gone to an onboard chip based storage mechanism for the bootloader. Meaning that even if your hard drive dies in a modern system, you can replace it without losing everything that makes the device work. The dead or dying PSX hard drives, the nature of its specialized controller, and the fact that this was a Japanese only device make it so that there are plenty of junk or four part systems out there for relatively cheap. At the very least, given the weight, it will give you a relatively heavy branded white box to hold down papers from gusts. 
Thanks to a boot solution called FMCB or Free McBoot, these systems can be turned into PS2 devices, so they still can act as a PS2. But thanks to both systems having a component video out, there's no tangible benefit in getting a PSX DVR to act as a PS2. It's actually cheaper to get a PS2 in good working order, or even PS2 systems in damaged conditions, such as the DVD laser being dead or motor being dead, and you'd still be able to play PS2 games on it. Now, such a thing is outside of the scope of the video today, but suffice it to say modern day collectors who really want a PSX DVR can and usually do turn their devices into free McBoot systems in order to play games off the network or disc. Now, there are other videos on how to turn a PSX DVR into an FMCB, and I will link those down below, but that will not be covered in today's video. The PSX DVR is certainly a fascinating piece of history, as it represented a leap forward in technology for home entertainment overall. The Xbox One, released in 2013, boasted that it was the all-in-one entertainment console, which was basically something that Sony had more or less cornered almost a decade earlier. But it feels like Sony was similar to Howard Stark in his sentiment when he said he was limited by the technology of his time. Still, it's a very impressive attempt to make a splash into the all-in-one entertainment landscape. And even if Sony considered the PSX a commercial failure, and modern collectors consider the PSX a failure, I would still consider the PSX a success in moving forward technological boundary. It was a convenient way to author DVDs, edit movies, pictures, and record over-the-air broadcast, but also served as a PS2 for more active entertainment. So in the end, you might be asking, should I get a PSX? And my own personal experience and fascination with the hardware aside, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Getting one of these in working conditions still ranges between $500 to $1,000, and there's no guarantee that they will last any longer than booting up the first time. Even if one was available and working, it's only a matter of time before the unit fails and ends up as a very expensive paperweight. And as mentioned earlier, hard drives only typically last around 5-7 to seven years before they die. These units are coming up on their 20th year, so likely they won't last very long. There are some things that you can do with the PSX, namely the aforementioned FMCB, but unless an aspiring hacker were to crack Sony's security measures, the time for the PSX DVR has already long since come and gone. Still, it was a fun ride for those along for it, and it was rewarding for me to go back and revisit the basal want instinct and the research to really discover what it was that I wanted back so many years ago. All that said, I hope you enjoyed the look at the history of PSX DVR and all of its eccentricities, and hope that everyone has a better appreciation for what it was. And who knows, perhaps one day it will have a resurgence if, say, fellow enthusiasts smarter than I am crack the code. And given the nature of the device and its limited niche interest, personally I'm not holding my breath. I would like to take a moment to personally thank you for sticking around to the end of the video, and I hope it was interesting enough to keep you entertained. We at the NPC Gaming Group appreciate your time and hope to see you for another video. And as always, see you next game.